you very much for inviting me here, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here and to meet all the people that some I met in Andover a few years ago, others I've just known on Facebook, and other people as well. But today I'm going to tell you about this project that I did through Grome House Museum. Now, Grome House Museum is a small museum on the Black Isle, which it's in Rosemarkey, a village of Rosemarkey, and you can see it marked there on the map. And the Black Isle is that section there, which is not really an island, it's just a peninsula, but it's always known as the Black Isle, with various theories about why it's called that. So, as Mike said, worked with five different groups. Now, this was a kind of outreach program for Grome House Museum. They managed to get some lottery funding, and the idea was that they were going to introduce the people of the area to the work of George Bain, because Grome House Museum actually holds the George Bain collection, and as well as a very impressive collection of Pictish stones. So this is the inside of the museum, um, large cross slab, but there's also lots of fragments around from the area. That side's probably the more well-known side because it's rather less weathered. Lots of key patterns for Michael there, um, some of which I've worked on myself. Um, but anyway, there's some of George Bain's work that's on display. That's his drawing of the Nig Stone. I'm going to have to study that. I've got a commission that I need to use that one for. So, um, But really, most of this project came about because of this person, Wendy, Wendy Sanders, and the boundless enthusiasm that she had and her ability to coax money out of bodies like Heritage Lottery Fund and, and that sort of thing. And so, really, she came to me because I'd worked with her in the past on other projects, and so when she managed to find this money, she came straight to me to do it. And the idea was to make five large felt wall hangings. Now, there were some restrictions about how we actually did the, the wall hangings, what we were going to make. Some of them were just very simple, practical ones, like the roll of paper that I had that I could do a design on a single sheet was four feet wide. So four feet wide seemed like quite a good bet. Also, sheets of timber come in four by eight. And I had one that had been cut down into three pieces that could join together and fit on top of tra trestle tables, which meant that I could take it with me but still fit it in the car. So four by eight seemed like quite a good starting size. Felt when you make it always shrinks, so you allow for that, you're going to end up with something that's a metre by two metres. So we drafted out a kind of general schematic of what it would be like. And this is the first group here. You can see there the idea was that there would be not work panels in the spaces round the, round the edges. As you see in lots of the illuminated manuscripts and on some of the Pictish stones, there are these sort of blocks of knotwork and key pattern around the side. We decided to stick with knotwork, it being slightly easier for people to get their heads around. So this was them studying the concept. Then they had to start the work of actually making the, the felt. So they're choosing their colours. And this is, this is just um, fleece that's been washed, wool fleece that's been washed, combed and dyed and they're choosing two colours to work with to make a double layer of the fibre to then trace onto some special paper the knotwork designs. Now, you'll see there that there's no overs and unders. That's really important at this stage. When you're working with textiles and you're doing this kind of... Um, layering of fabrics to get your designs. You do not want the overs and unders because it means you end up cutting where you don't want to cut. 
There's one bit where they've actually drawn the line in. Uh, I think I've got a pointer. There, where somebody's got a bit carried away with drawing their lines. But as a general rule, you don't want those lines. So the idea was that they laid these, this is special paper, they drawn on it with permanent markers, spirit markers, so that the, the ink wouldn't run into the wet felt, because that's wet felt that they've got there, and they're cutting out the shapes. The next stage is that we're making the background. So those were going to be the knots. Now we're making the background, and it's a question of laying down the fleece. And then decorating it up. So there were two layers of the white wool. And then the idea was to cover it up and make it maybe something that might be reminiscent of a Pictish stone or reminiscent of a bit of aged vellum. Um, but something that didn't look spanking brand new. Wetting it all down, rubbing it with soapy water, and then they could lay on all the pieces that they'd cut out. And we had quite a lot of time playing about um, deciding which bit would go where, and they were influenced by colour, and they were influenced by the designs they'd chosen. Some of these designs they'd drawn themselves, some of them I had given them a template to work from, because it really depended how much ability they had themselves. Um, the little bits of ribbon that are in the table, on the table in the middle here, weren't part of the design. They were actually just little bits that we'd cut to lay on top of the felt so that they could see where the overs and unders were going to go. And they could work them all out before they started cutting with scissors. You'll see there, they've got scissors in their hands. And what they're doing is they're cutting through. I don't know if you can see bits that they've cut. Now, one of the things about wool is that when you felt it, it shrinks. And it shrinks more the more you rub it. So if you've got two layers of colour, as you have here, there's a bright red and there's a dark red underneath. The bright red is closer to your hands, it's getting more rubbing, so it shrinks more. So where you've cut it, it actually pulls away and you see more of it. So that once those bits were all on and cut, they covered it up with bubble wrap and rubbed some more. And then we turned it over and rubbed on the back. And then we had to squeeze out all the water that was there. But then you're left with something like this, and you can see here all those bits where we'd cut to get our overs and unders. Now, I have to say, I could have done with some of Courtney's blue lights, <laughs> um, <laughs> trying to get people to learn both a new medium for working in and a new design concept. And for them, it was a new concept because Really, although they've, they, these were all people living on the Black Isle within a stone's throw of Grome House Museum in Rosemarkey, they'd never been in. As so often happens, the locals don't go to the places that the tourists go to. The space in the middle was all going to be filled. Each group chose their own text and concept of what they wanted to do. And this particular image, this is from the group at Kilboke, and they, they were a church group. So we were working in the church hall, which is also a community centre. And they decided to have the evangelist page from the Book of Kells and a biblical quote in it. So I don't know if you can... Oh, sorry. See, we're actually uh, working through stencils. I don't know if you can just make out there um, the there's a sort of translucent plastic sheet in which I'd cut holes and what they're doing is they're poking wool through with felting needles, technique called needle felting, 
and it just allows you to be quite precise. And the lines across were just pieces of ribbon that had been pinned in place while they worked so that they kept their text reasonably straight. I'm not sure how they did that in the illuminated manuscripts because it's not something I've made a study of, but we used ribbon. And you can see them all there. With there's, Some are working on the not work at the sides, some are working in, in the middle. It was partly who was interested in which bit and who, was, who had longest arms and longest back to reach over into the middle of the table. But that's the centre of that, the three sections. It was easier to photograph that way. Um, but it was still wet and a bit rough and ready and not all the knot work had been done. But you can see where we're tramlining the, the edges of the knotwork, and this really picks out the overs and unders. So it took them a while to get their heads round. You can see on the back, the, what the needle does is it pushes the, pushes the fibres through the felt base that you're working on. And so that's the back of it. You can see quite clearly where they've, where they've poked the wool through. And this was one, this was from the village of Och, the group there. And Och was a, a very famous fishing village in the time of the herring. And this was a, a verse from the poem, The Silver Darlings. And you can perhaps see the fish there swimming in, a, in and out of the knotwork. Um, and then the the last group that I worked with was the Muir of Ord Art Society group. So they had lots of ideas. They were, they were more adventurous in their knot work um, in that they, they decided to do some zoomorphic work as well. Um, but they also wanted to include things that were related to the village. So it was renowned for its illicit whiskey stills of which there were something like 126 in the village at one point. <laughs> um, it was also a, a, there was a prisoner of war camp and there was military barracks and things like that. So they had the poppies for remembrance. And the, the reason the town came into existence was through the cattle droving. So they had the black cattle from there. So that was, and somebody had written a poem. Now, throughout all these groups that we had. Each, each group spent five days working on their felt over a period of a month. So like you'd have one day one week, one day the next, well two days the next week, another day the next week, and another day the last week. And I worked on them one in January, one in February, one in March. We had a break over Easter, did one in May and one in June. And what we found was that as we were working, lots of people in the locality would come in and observe what we were doing and sometimes try their hand and add in a little bit more. But here, we're almost at the end of it. You can see them struggling. This is You're mostly seeing the back of it there, but it allows you to see quite clearly the effort that they've put into doing that needle felting all around the edges to emphasise the, the designs. And that's it upside down, and they're just putting more soapy water on to do the final wetting down, final rubbing, turning it over, and rubbing some more. This is really just soapy water and muscle power is what makes felt. Um, you can do it with, with things like washboards and what have you, but the invention of bubble wrap was a boon to people making felt. <laughs> And then you've got all this soapy water that you've got to squeeze in. So I'd, I'd got a big plastic box just for, the, just for the purpose. And then the really hard work begins because it's all got to be rolled. And it's got to be rolled backwards and forwards to a count of about 200 each direction on each side. So that's eight times. So we did it as teamwork. And then, of course, you've got to do it along the, the length as well as the width. So a lot of effort. But at the end of that day, 
They had something to hang up. And of course, everybody wanted to photograph it. And then after all five were completed, we had a party for all the groups. Somebody had a lovely sort of open barn and we hung them all up in there. So that was the five wall hangings. And then they went on display in the Highland Council headquarters where they were well received. And after that, they went to the Celtic Connections, um, what do you call it? Celtic Connections event in Glasgow. Mostly a, cast, mostly a music festival, but they have artwork on display. So these were displayed there. And then this was the one that was made, the first one actually of the groups. This was made by the Grome House Museum volunteers and it's currently on display in, in the museum. And that's the end. So I'm very happy to take questions, but if, Mike, you would prefer to leave it till later, I'm happy to do that. We do have a, a maybe five minutes. Well. Uh, I'll tell you what, uh, I had a special request. Um, it's kind of one of many today. <laughs> um, to have a photograph of everybody taken outside the front, uh, maybe in about uh, ten minutes. Uh, would everybody be happy to do that yeah, in before tea? Uh, so we've still got five minutes to right. have a few. Well, one of yeah. the things yeah. I should say, yeah. I forgot to mention as I was speaking there, I did bring with me a, a large format A3 book that would made, that covered the, the progress of the things. So if, if anybody wants to read the step-by-step -step instructions, I forgot to bring it in from the car this morning, but my husband said he would go out and get it. And I think magically while we've been in here, it should have appeared in the exhibition room so people can look there. But I'm happy to take any questions if people have, have any. Uh, this is uh, Ed here, sitting in front. Oh, yep. <laughs> um, how did the people respond to doing this stuff? Did they enjoy it to any I, degree? Or? They, yes, they did. I mean, th there were some people who just kind of threw their hands up in horror and said, oh, I can't cope with that, with Celtic knot work. They were happy to do the felting, but they really just kind of had a mental block about doing the, working out the interlace. There were others who said, why haven't I discovered this before? And I think we're definitely going to go on and try drawing designs and working in, with them in different ways. Um, in terms of the, the purpose of the project for you know, actually bringing the work of the museum to a wider audience, it served its purpose because, I mean, I showed you that last slide, the one that was up on display in Grome House Museum, because that was made by the Grome House volunteers. That was the first group. But the other ones were made, I mentioned one in the village hall the, the community centre and church at Kilboki, that's on display in the church. So everybody that comes into the church sees it and they ask questions about it and they get inspired and so it ser serves the purpose. Another two went into village halls and the final one, the Muir of Ord, one went into the community hub in Muir of Ord. I think where they have a library as well. So people are seeing these. Yes, people were mostly enthused by learning about Celtic design. Even though we kept it very simple, they could see the potential for going further with it. Thank you. Hi Ruth, um, Nicola Dixon here. Is Hi. this a technique that was, I mean, I'm aware that felting has been used in the past, but felting and Celtic knot work and these sort of panels, well, is the, the, historical? The process is called the inlay method. And I'm not aware of other people using it for Celtic design. 
but it's very well a very well established technique this cutting out a half made piece of felt and laying it onto a background has been widely used for the likes of the Kyrgyzstan carpets and uh, Mongolian felts and things like that. You know, so the, the process is widely used. I'm not aware of other people having used it specifically to do Celtic design. I'm not saying they haven't, but I'm not aware of it. Thank you. Um, good morning. I just wanted to ask you, do you source your wool from a particular type of, you know, I, do I, you have to be specific about the type of wool that you use? We, for this project, we used uh, merino wool. Two reasons for that. One is the ready availability of it in lots of different colours, so it's, it's, um, it's, it's easily sourced. The main reason, though, is that of all the different varieties of wool that are out there, merino is the one that felts most easily. And it was important for each of these groups that they had an end product that didn't have holes, that would serve its purpose of being a decorative element in their village hall or wherever. So to ensure that they would actually get good results, we used merino wool to make it work. But you can felt with any kind of wool. Some just take a lot more muscle power. Some take an awful lot more preparation. And the, the second part of the question is going to be, how long will that piece last then? Like if the moths don't get at it, it should last indefinitely if it's properly, properly displayed. M I, I did advise all of them to put moth sashes behind the wall hanging and change them at least once a year. Whether they do that or not, I don't know. You know, <laughs> you, you can't tell. But, I mean, wool fibre will last, will last indefinitely. Um, if it's properly cared for. Thank you. And a comment. Um, I think one of the wonderful things about this is that it's public art. And so much of the, the Celtic art of our generation has been very personal things, like jewelry and, and tattoos and things for the whole. But, um, I, think that's, I think that's really true. And for me, I mean, most of us all kind of work away in our little corners and it's quite difficult to uh, somebody was speaking yesterday I'm trying to think who it was um, yeah about uh, yeah but no there was somebody mentioned was it Ed somebody had asked Ed a question about whether he taught other people and he was saying, no, he mostly sort of worked from his little, own little corner. And for me, that's very much the case. I work in my studio. I might not see anybody from one day to another. And to have the opportunity to go out and share both my love of the felt-making medium and the, the style of design with a whole new audience was just lovely. And the fact that they actually paid me to do it was better still. Um, and it's good to get out there. I mean, when you work like that, well, for a start, I could tackle a much bigger piece than I would physically be able to manage all on my own. I mean, you saw those slides of the doing the rolling. That would have been such hard work to have done on my own. I mean, I, I could do it. I have done big pieces for myself, but it's physically hard work. So getting other people to do the donkey work for you is a really good idea. 